first is that whenever you listen to this record, have a notebook handy and make notes as we go along. The second is that... Wake the farm Wake up! The farm Welcome up. to the show. <laughs> Maintaining Ground podcast. Shut the farm up! Season 2, episode 6. It's gonna get funky. <laughs> Hey, this is your host, Andy the Elf. We got an exciting show here. We're talking about how plants move, how they groove, and how there's music everywhere that's just keeping things funky. That's how the ecosystem interchanges things, how the insects do it, how the plants do it. We'll be exploring all of that. We'll be exploring that with urban gardeners and how they move plants around from one yard to another. And we'll talk about how Insects are attracted to certain flowers and certain barks and things of that nature. And we'll be talking to Funk Master. And we'll be hearing about funk music and how how a musician that can make such amazing cuts and slices with the guitar can be also out there like planting things and growing things and, and have such appreciation for what we're bringing forth here with wake the farm up find a way to support the show no further words it's time for the show we got johnny rubush nate morehouse and p Funk. welcome to the show showtime 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 live streaming in now here too. We're gonna set them down. Everybody calm down, it's cool. We can handle that. All right, we got people over there in the far bleachers, they're getting restless right now. What, 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 right now we're talking about planting, planting the funk in the farm tonight. We're putting in some pollination kind of aspects. And we're going to have some amazing guests here tonight. I'll introduce that in a minute here. But first, I want to talk about this show. Once again, thank you all for supporting the show and coming out tonight. Thank you all you listeners who've been listening to this and enjoying what we're bringing. And the feedback's amazing. I've heard some amazing ones, right? Like one, like the jam band of podcasts. <laughs> I love that, right? The jam band of podcast. We're jamming. You know, last time we explored loops and the loopholes and how the show loops things around and we looped right back to it, waking the farm up. So, to tell you about here with all the food carts that are going around down all the aisles, we got some pineapple sage tea tonight. That's a salvia elegance. It's an amazing salvia tea from Mesoamerica. It grows in the mountaintops in the cloud forests. We can grow it here. It'll get cold in the winter time though, and its roots will die out. But if you got a microclimate, you can plant it. And that's what I do. I grow these things and I grow them here. And the pineapple sage has antidepressant qualities to it. That's why I'm so happy tonight. It's because I've been drinking so much of that pineapple. Look at these people down here in the tea, the tea lounge section. It's like really, they've been hanging out drinking this tea like for like an hour now or something. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So. Is that to say? The other things we got going back there, you guys probably saw it on your way in. There was the people with the orange vests again, and they had their notebooks out, and they were asking questions about nuts, right? They kind of looked like like squirrels, but they were people somehow. That's just like the magic that comes out sometimes, you know, like you start seeing the magic attributes of other people, and sometimes they come out as animalistic, and those are all forms of humanity, you know? You're sitting there cracking your nuts. We got two different kinds of nuts back here, too. We got the Juggalos Japonica. That's the Japanese heart nut. If you crack it just right, 
he'll have a nutshell that he can use as like a little print. He can dip it in an ink pad and then dip it on a piece of paper and it'll make a little heart shape for you instantly, just like that. Nuts, right? And the other one is our native black walnut, the Jekyllins Nigra. It is a really hard nut to crack, but if you get that right angle and pop it open, you get a good chunk of that dry, delicious, perfectly cured walnut meat in there. It's a unique flavor, nothing else like it, nothing else smells like it. It's got anti-worm properties to it, so when you eat it, it goes into your gut system and it'll help take out parasites. So like you can get more of that nutrition for yourself. Yeah. Yes. So, that's some of the plant the plants that are, have joined our uh, our show tonight here. I'm imagining there's gonna be many others that come up. So part of this like whole pollination thing comes from this amazing attribute of plants to move and how they can move. And when we bring funk into the farm and get this funky farm woken up tonight, we're definitely gonna feel like you know, we know our plants are moving to the music. Our plants are like figuring out ways to get to where they want to go. They're dancing. This thing's called walking onions. They're an onion that grow a nodule of onions up on top. And when they get to the right weight, they just tip over. And if you watch them over time, they walk. They go from one place, and they'll walk across the yard if they got the right soil for it. There's things like raspberries, blackberries, the bramble berries and how they grow and thrive at the edge of the forest. That's where most of our foods and, and most high abundance of diversity happens is at the edges of forests, the edges of ponds, these places where two different life forms meet together and create this habitat that has ample amount of space for both of them. So it's all happening there. There's more sunlight, there's more this, that, or the other thing. So these plants, they just move as the forest edge grows naturally. If you come in and destroy the forest edge, they'll stay in the same spot. They'll walk right back where they were and just start it over again. When you let them go again, they'll just start walking out, tip it one little beat at a time, and they'll tip in another little rootlet. That's a way they can move. And then there's other plants, they move when the wind blows. And they'll come just across the plant, carry those seeds out far off adventurous places and, and land and have their time and their turn. Then there's other plants that are obnoxious to us sometimes, you know. They'll plant their, they'll spread their plants by getting into your dog's fur or into your socks or even like hang it up onto the side of your legs and you'll like find this big wad of seeds there. It's just one of their ways of traveling and getting their, you know, way of moving and moving to the funk. <coughs> That's how we loop that around. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited for this pollination stuff tonight, too. We're gonna, I know we're going to end some other things here tonight. So let me tell you about some of our guests tonight. We have, first coming up, we're going to have two minutes from Johnny Rubles back here. And looking forward to that. He's a longtime friend of mine. And Urban gardener, he's done a lot of gardening in the urban areas, but I know he's had a lot of experiences in other places too, for sure. And I've been involved in some of the garden projects we've worked on together. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that and you know sharing some of our stories together with you all as well. And after that we got an entomologist, Nate, that's more in the house than all of you tonight. And He's gonna come up here and we're gonna, I'm looking forward to what he has to share in two minutes. He's an amazing bug, insect, friend of mine. Like, he, he would come to me with plants and I would come to him with insects back before the AIs were as good as they are now where I can just send a picture of a bug to an AI in an app now and it'll just tell me what it is and I don't have to bug him like three times a day. Like, do you check out this other weird one I saw? And, <laughs> it's going to be so fun to hear about, you know, more stuff that we get into talking about with him. And also tonight, we have a very special guest. we got P-Funk, who's going to be sharing a little jams, sharing conversations. He and I often are found talking about all kinds of different plants and stuff that we can grow in our own yards and, 
you know, I definitely look forward to hearing more about what he has to share about that as well as about his music. So here we go, waking the farm up tonight. Yeah, so for all our audio listeners and everybody that's listening to this show too, we are excited to keep building this show and growing it. We're excited that we have some shows that we'll be announcing here soon. And not quite yet, just to keep you on your toes. But we've got exciting things happening. Of course, you know, exciting things happening. You know, we need some funding. So here's my little radio show. You know, subscribe, 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 subscribe. But, you know, also, if you can figure out a way to help support us, that would be freaking awesome. Thank you. Wake the farm up. We're going there. One step at a time. <coughs> so everybody feeling good? Feeling, feeling the uh, relaxing effects of the herbal teas and the, this sustaining feeling of eating some of these nuts back here? Yeah. Everybody having a good time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we ready for a guest here? You guys want to see some? See where the show goes here? You guys know how the show works, right? So a guest comes up here and they get two minutes uninterrupted, which means all of us. And after that two minutes is up, then we get to interrupt them if we want. And we can, but the whole goal is for that person to get me to say, wake the farm up. Okay? And then after that, we'll go into a conversation. There have been, uh, you know, on some adventures that haven't been recorded moments where I've had to be the sustainable bully that just said, uh, shut the farm up. <laughs> but this is the calibrated two minute sand dial piece here. So we'll have this up here by my dog's head. And we'll flip that at the right moment. Man, it looks like you went to like Middle Earth and got that, man. Huh? That was forged by the elves. With three, three different nations. I believe you. <laughs> I believe you did. It was at least by. Was it really forged? Right. This is the calibrated two minute sand dial piece here. So we'll have this up here by my dog's head. And we'll flip that at the right moment. Yeah, here comes Johnny Rubush. Urban Gardener, coming from Northside, South Cumminsville, Cincinnati. Here we go. people that are doing these amazing things and following their passions. Yeah, yeah. Look forward to hearing you here. Two minutes. All right, my two months has begun. Oh, well, you know, when this, we've been doing a lot of things like going to sleep in a way, and, you know, a lot of destruction and degradation of the forest and the earth, and our systems became like dust bowls and little things blew away and um, people were <laughs> suffering, like great Sarah suffering, you know, and like uh, Iran and Iraq and they're sitting there pushing the tire up a hill. And, you know, you know, so we've done a lot of things to put the world, you know, just to bed, you know, and nature and stuff. and. Um, forgot about ecosystems and well, when we look at you know the barnyard uh, you know the farmyard we're like <laughs> saying can we see all the dung beetles use and the chicken and um, the sow and all these things that would you know feeding each other cleaning up after each other you know even predation as a 
system that we have to respect. And, you know, what is the power of the rooster? You know, what, what is he trying to say? And, you know, he protects his hands. That's one of the big things that he likes to do is, uh, you know, protect. But, you know, in the morning he's got like a clock inside of him or something. But, you know, we uh, have to, you know, find our morning, you know, the time to wake up and like really wake up, not like woke. Like, yeah, okay, we're, we're being nice and paying attention to people's feelings because, you know, that's important. But, you know, the, the waking has to continue, you know. The, the forest is, you know, mirrored in our projects of a, of a farm. Wake the farm up. I love, I love how you concluded that with the reflection, the mirror, that water like reflection of that coming back. Yeah, I was thinking about the the way the farm up is a challenge. It's a real challenge. Um, but you know, language is is a is a is a tool that we're out there like a. You know, it's one of our most powerful tools in the tool shed, really. And you know, we use it to communicate with each other and maybe, you know, leave something behind and like, make the world a brighter, better place. Like, somebody invented, like, shoes, you know? I mean, we didn't even have, like, the right foot and the left foot shoe up until, like, 150 years ago. At least, you know, the, the uh, colonial, you know, war, you know, uh, what do you call them, Civil War era? It was a rough time. I mean, we killed each other and killed each other off. And uh, it's still been going on. I mean, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. You know, it's like, when does it stop? I mean, that's a lot of trees. We just keep chopping all the trees down. And, and you know, I mean, some use of trees is good. It's Ohio. We, we like, grow trees here. Yeah, we got a lot of trees here in Ohio. Yeah. But yeah, like, if people are going to start eating them, like, how would they eat them? You know, I mean, like if everybody had a wood stove right now, yeah, like our forest around here would be eaten up quick. For that sure. That's how everybody depended on heat. Yeah, lots of good wood around here, hardwood. Um, you know, these little pellet stoves, I think that's kind of cool. Like, so yeah. I don't know, everybody out there, there's people burning wood tonight because it's cold. Yeah, um, yeah, isn't it fascinating though? Like, I think what I read was the highest number of population of people during the ice age of people in general was about 40,000 people. It's like all of us now on the earth that are here are the result of those people who were able to adapt and live through all that. That's amazing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, all of us are big human family that survived, you know, we're all survivors, and it's pretty amazing, like, your grandma went through some crazy stuff, and her grandma, and, and you know, it's untold stories, millions and millions yeah, they, of them, They know? couldn't even tweet about it or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> we're, yeah, we're in the times where it's gonna all be recorded. And Maybe it's, like, carved in, like, the rafters in the attic or something. Yeah, it probably is, and, you know, the forest is, you know, that goes in your life. You know, with, uh, the little things you do and stuff, and like, you know, it comes comes back on you. So, you know, if you give your kid a BB gun, tell them not, what not to shoot. You know, and tell them to be nice. And, you know, I mean, people, there's, there's a lot of learning we have to do, I guess, but it's a party too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's endless war, but somehow we fucking have to get through it. And, uh, war is such a party foul. Yeah. Don't mean to bring it up, but it was on my list of things to talk about. I also had loofah sponges. Those were a good time. Oh, yeah, you like that. Yeah. We used to grow that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And tell, yeah, tell us about how it was grown so people might not know. Yeah, loofah's one of my favorite plants. It, it trails up like a small fence or something and um, drops these big green, like, fruit looking things, and you rip the sides of them off, and it, like, Inside is this like skeletal structure that is the loofah, and you drive it out, wash it out a little bit, 
shit called the little seeds yeah, out Yeah, get these there. seeds out. The seeds got all out. It's got this oil on it. I mean, you can wash your dishes with it for like a year and a half. And it just keeps cleaning itself because it has this natural oil to it. And uh, not just, you know, in the bathroom or something. You got one for that in the shower and stuff. But you can also keep one like a sponge and clean your dishes with it. And I swear. Yeah. I, you they're, know. they're great scrubbers for sure. Yeah. I like them in the bath. Yeah. Good old, uh, good old Lufa and some bubble bath. You ever eat them when they're young? Yeah, you can eat them too, like a okra. Yeah. 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 Or Chinese okra. It's good stuff. Uh, it's not as good as real okra, but it's a, it's a useful, easy to grow plant. Way easier, you know, than you think. And you get these lasting sponges and you can give them away, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're great presents. And, uh, yeah. Chop one down into three little pieces. And they make enough seeds that you can save them for the next year. Yep, for sure. You give some to your friends. Yeah, it's a good trade item. And I think that was another thing that you I noticed you were doing back in the day at the farmer's market with your Indian blanket, sitting there, taking time with each person. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, you, you, you made a lot of friends back then because, you know, People wanted to know about that stuff. They wanted to know about you and, and why are you so interesting and stuff. And they're, uh, yeah, I think they still want to know, and they're you know just craving ways to learn about it that flows with them and is in a way that is fun or inspiring or makes it even look fun. I mean, sometimes it's hard to be like, yeah, I really want to go live a life where I have to chop wood to stay warm in the winter, and I have to like dig up my rutabagas and I have to can my tomatoes and I have to do all these things when you know you have a lifestyle where you're already able to just pay for all that stuff. It's super good. But you want it, you know, you want to like learn how to do some part of it, you know, bring that into your life. Yeah. And that, yeah, I've always been about that, encouraging people, you know, like they might not do anything, maybe they just make their own homemade kombucha something like that. Or maybe they take out their neighbor's trash. And that's just something they do. I know just having like one thing, or at least, you know, composting or recycling, you know, and starting with a little bit of diet, you know, thinking about your diet, adding in a little bits of wild plants. I felt like that was one of the strong points for me when I was taking like brand new nutrients from different little plants that grew around me. That was really the superfood I used to call it. Like, you know, yeah, like really, just these little bags I would make of, you know, clovers and burdocks and um, lamb's quarter was one of my favorite. Lamb's quarter plant, if you learn one Cincinnati plant, oh, yeah. there's a good friend around here makes a great spinach. Really? Yeah. It's, it's like a summertime spinach. It's, there's different greens as the seasons go around, and that's like a warm season green that you can pick even when it's hot out, and it's still really delicious. And it's related to the quinoa. It'll eventually get little seeds on it that you can collect as well and make into a flower. Yeah. I've only made it What's into it look like, like? cereal. It's it? really easy. You just kind of boil it like that as it is. It has a goose foot, like, shape to its leaf. It's in the, like the same family as spinach and beets and the amaranth. The goose foot. Genopodium, right? Yeah. So, it's a good friend, man. Yeah, it's a great plant. I have a variety of it called Magenta Spring, and that variety gets like, a, like an accented pink color to the young growth. Right. It makes it really pretty and like definitely more like exciting to pick and put into a salad. You know, when you have these different colors, it's fun to have greens, but when there's greens that have a little color jazz to it, you know, it makes the salad a little bit more funky, you know? Yeah. We want a funky farm salad. Yeah. No, it's, uh, there's a lot of funky plants out there and a lot to explore. I mean, you like craft <laughs> beers, you know, you can try these plants, all these different plants, and look it up on YouTube and be like, how do I handle burdock? How do I clean it? How do I make it into a tea, you know, I was just watching it, and they're like, even the little sticky Velcro things that ride on you, yeah. um, they, they, they can be made into a tea, they, you know, I mean, you can almost make anything into a tea, you know, that's the great part about tea, but, um, 
you know, nutrients. So, so There's little nutrients that are in wild plants. That's what I think is real interesting. Yeah. So you, do you think you could make, like, like if you just had burrs on your pant legs from burdock, you just pull that off and throw it into a pot of hot water? Yeah, it's trying to tease, trying to come home with you. It's like... <laughs> Please. It just makes sense, right? Put me inside you. Take like my seed. <laughs> what, that's, what the, that's what plants, that's what they act like. They're, they're uncouth, yeah. Wake the farm up, Andy. Wow. Is he prepared to wake the farm? That's a reach farm. Alright, we'll give him a wake the farm up, man. He earned it. He had one right in there. He had one right in there. Wake the farm up. Wake the farm up. Uh, this guy's been waking the farm up in the Cincinnati area for years now. I know he's been other places, but he's been holding it pretty down in the Cincinnati area, growing with a lot of different groups and organizations over the time. He had a plot in Northside, I know, that had like a greenhouse on it and whatnot. What, what's been some of the... What's something from all your growing experience, like what were some of the most exciting, fun parts of it? Mm. That's the shit I You know, making the little oven, little clay oven, and then digging up the little potatoes that I had like got the seeds from a dumpster diving event and then planted them in like composted stuff from a community garden with straw and getting digging these little potatoes out, chopping them up, mixing them with some rainwater out of this crazy rainbow, and then cooking it and letting it simmer, like, you know, and eating yeah. this, like, potato soup that was, like, just so real. Like, you know, that's what I'm saying with those blood, like, I don't know, micronutrients or those micro spiritual nutrients of things, doing little things, like, and be re 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 rewarding. Uh, the whole process was really rewarding. I mean, all my gardens got taken away and bulldozed in the end. And, you know, the trees grew up around my other ones. And I sold my greenhouses to schools and stuff. But, uh, to schools? Yeah. Nice. You know, on the cheek, just help them out. And, you know, Andy, I think he, he builds those sometimes. And now still, uh, the hoop houses. Uh, it's a pretty simple system. Hoop, hoops up. That was, that was what I used to do back in the day. I had a business for a while called Hoops Up. And I would put up hoop houses for people. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. And that, that can really keep you in the growing the greens into the springtime and whatnot. Yeah, it's a, a season extension. You're not like actually heating it necessarily. You could, I guess. But it's a passive solar system where you're basically making a microclimate that protects it from hard freezes. You can even put a tiny hoop house on the inside of a hoop house and it'll protect its double layer. And that way you can be growing salad greens of different sorts and radishes into through the winter pretty much. With the right seeding and timing of everything. Yeah. So that's that's something I did for yeah. years and I don't know that too, and there's a lot of little lessons and stuff along the way. Um, well, you guys did water crust in that greenhouse, right? Yeah, yeah, for, the one that like I, I had for a while. You know, with like buying nutrients and running it like a giant a water, like, system. Of, yeah, yeah. water system. It was cool. It's a lot of work. You need to be there all the time. You need to be real close to it. And there's a lot of inputs. You know, you. You know, I went for more of a low input, low cost, uh, save your seed kind of. Uh, just work with with the ground in the regular seasons and stuff and the season extension is really good for market people or you know a little bit for your house just for security you know like throwing a little hoop house off the back of your house and just yep. having some kale growing in there in case you had to try to you know well it just you know, tastes good and it yeah, tastes good like, too you can just grow way better stuff than you can even get at the store I mean, so yeah i mean like on this show we're all about like the hope stay preppers you know it's like we're growing that shit because it tastes good. We want to feed our families good nutrients and stuff. Okay. Sure, if there's okay. a doomsday situation, we got what we need. We're okay. And that's fine because that works into the Hope's Day thing anyway. Right? So check off the checklist of the doomsday pepper too. But, you know, there we go. Yep, yep. It does taste good. You know. It tastes really good. Like, what do you think? It, like... He and I also uh, were involved in a Jerusalem artichoke 
situation for like over a year now where like not now like over a year that we're definitely hustling a lot of Jerusalem artichokes right at a time when people hadn't heard of what they were quite so much around here so it was like a big hype two years later like like everybody was like selling them at farmers markets and they're way more common now but we grew a lot of those things and sold a lot of those Jerusalem artichokes yeah yeah, for sure. That that was definitely a money crop. I mean, they're they're a very uh, hardy and healthy, and figuring out the system about digging them up and spacing them out, giving them space to regrow in the next year, and you could get uh, quite the production out of any little lot. You know, with not not, not that much sun. You know, it's a sunflower's right. cousin, and uh, grown for its root. And um, you know. There you go. And you had a little purple variety, I think. Uh, yep. We put in some of those, yeah. Were the roots purple? The roots were purple. Yeah. 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 So the Jerusalem well. artichoke is also known as the sunchoke. It's a native root to the area here. It's in the sunflower family. It's a uh, helianthus uh, tuberosa. It's har you harvest the roots in the fall and all through the winter, anytime the ground's not frozen, basically. And I've had one or two plants I've pulled over and have filled a half bushel basket just off of one plant. They're amazingly abundant and cook and taste very similar to potatoes. They definitely have a little different taste, a little nuttier. What do you, what do you, how would you describe the flavor of a good roasted Jerusalem artichoke? It does have a nice texture and um, a nutty flavor. The the best was just leaving them in the oven, like and forgetting about them, watching a movie, and then like two hours they're like cooked down to a, a fine gourmet uh, little tater. Right. Yeah. I love putting them in soups. You just cut them up, and then they float around and kind of disintegrate, almost like they almost kind of separate out like fish meat would. It was like flakes apart. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interesting plant and. I think it has good benefits for diabetics and it has something called inulin or something like that. Yeah, it's not quite insulin, but yeah. it's similar in some way. Yeah, I have to do more research on that probably, but... Yeah, we've got a team on it over there, the research balcony just went nuts. There's more Yep. Yep. Keeping it alive here at the Wake the Farm Up. Just have everybody have a good holiday. The solstice is around the corner. And the, uh, have you been uh, growing and gardening? Like, what are some of your current kind of projects that you've been working on? I got like a swimming pool, the kind of ones from Kroger that cost like $10. Filled it up with soil and stuff, you know, old, old pieces of, uh, you know, edging from the grass and stuff, and a couple bags of compost, and I've been growing in that now, and, uh, you know, lettuces, and, you know, the weeds, I have a, you know, guilty pleasure for the weeds, letting them come up in there, and the plantain, and a lot of people have guilty pleasure for the weeds, <laughs> so, you know, it's hard to resist, because they're so energetic, you know, the uh, overly bred kind of slow cabbages and stuff are cool, but you see all these weeds just coming up with the vigor. Uh, you can't yeah. help but be a little... I, I love what the weeds will tell you about the soil. A lot of times they'll yeah. tell me so many things. They'll tell me, like, whether it's loose, like, enough that they can get their roots in. Is it got potassium in it? Like, are they discoloring slightly purple? Are they, you know, thriving? Like, what, like, is there, what group of plants is there? Is it a wetland? You know, is it an upland? Is it somewhere where water sits in there and creates a microactivity of a wet area that only lets a certain group of plants grow there? Is there a certain mining plant? As we talked in a podcast recently about these accumulator plants, that are setting their deep tap roots in and making nutrients come up where they're growing. Are there those there? Are, like, what are those plants known for generating and accumulating larger amounts of? So 
So like I look out at like these cornfields out by it in the rural areas around here and in the spring you'll see just like garlic everywhere, like wild with little onion grass. And then like what I've learned people are doing is they actually spray it with something and then they come back and then they add sulfur to the soil. But if they would just let like the cycles of natural ecosystem happen, all these garlic plants are trying so hard to put like a sustained source of sulfur into the soil from out of the thin air. They're collecting it out of the air and putting it right there for the soil and then they're just like killing that and it's not doing its full course so it's going to keep trying over and over and over. So Yeah, yeah I definitely think those observations are super important in, in seeing the, the little groups of plants that you have and what that represents as far as what you're right. saying, that what's in the soil, what's your soil missing. I mean, if I could go back in time to my best garden and, and wait of the first year and not do anything, that would have been the pro tip, you know, because you, you gain so much by observation and, and most human endeavors folly, and, you know, it's like, oh, you know, feed yourself and you learn and then, you know, you know, thinking about your impact, uh, one of my favorite little little groupings of the plants, you know, those guilds or whatever, you know, yeah. creating those little worlds and then in the summer you're laying there and you're looking, looking in the grass and you're looking at these little guilds where they have different landing spots for insects and you create this whole little world where they're like flying around and dodging leaves and going, you know, and you're like, I'm fucking, I'm doing this, I'm, you know, and they're, they look, they look back at you, these little winged like things, like looking at you, yeah, yeah. like fairies. Yeah. I swear, and then you're like, oh, bro, man, I can't Wait believe the, the fairies, up. but <laughs> if you get, yeah, yeah it, that's, it's a lot of fun yeah, we, gardening, we, I totally yeah. recommend it. And, uh, I mean, Woo! So we got, you know, gnomes, we got, uh, you know, you know, little Buddha heads in this. I don't know if I feel about those Buddha heads, but, uh, the Buddha heads in the garden. yeah, in the garden, I'm like, I don't know, you know, if that was a little head of Jesus, <laughs> just in some in the Asian person's garden, I'd be like, that's weird. What do you, you know, but, you know, people got their things, you know, I actually have an area on my land that I call the broken Buddha, uh, sanctuary. And over time, I've gone through a lot of projects and jobs where people have an old Buddha statue and like the ear fell off or something and they want to replace it with a new one. So I'll take the broken Buddha and I'll take it to this area where they all just fall apart together. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Makes sense. I think Buddha would be down with that. Yeah, I think so. Or up with that. Man. Yeah, it's, it'd be up and down and left and right. And <laughs> centered on it. Yeah. It just is. <laughs> are, we, are we are we overstanders, understanders, or understanders of these matters? Or all three? The food is no, here. I see him up on the balcony. Did you see that guy came here? Like, is that actually Buddha? It might be. I think. It's just could be a shave head man. I, I did just get a message from uh, one of the food production okay. staff that he did just come up to the food cart where they had the tea and the nuts and stuff and ask them to make them one with everything. Nice. Yeah. Classic one. Welcome, welcome to Guantanamo and Buddha. Yeah, we like Buddha. Yeah, I mean, this dude's popular, man. He's like, tried to end all suffering, but, you know, uh, building little buildings for my quails, we got these quails, and, it, and you know, everything we did, we did a little group, you know, and then building a little shack for these quails, and, and um, watching the different animals come up and take a look at them and stuff. Like, like one day, a big old owl flew down and just landed there and looked at the quail like a 
if I could get in that cage, I would eat you so <laughs> bad, That's you know. That's right, you had quail. I remember those birds. They were so tiny and sweet. Yeah, they were super sweet. They were, they, Coupled up, yeah. And we've talked about quail eggs on this show before, but they're just amazing. They're tiny little eggs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Bob White, American. Yeah. They're native, yeah. They, most of them died off in 1977 in the blizzard that uh, was so cold it buried them in, under the snow along oh. the farm fields in Ohio. But they're making a comeback, you know. Uh, well, the, uh, quail, yeah. There we go. Wrapping up Johnny Rubush's set with a little bit about quail, one of our indigenous fowl that fly around and live in our shrubbery. You know, a lot of urban gardens have fire pits, you know, and create this fun atmosphere where you can just stick a bell pepper on a stick and just fire roast your own pepper and just hang out and have some good banter about what's yeah. growing on your land and fun stuff like that. So, yeah, again, thanks, there, you know, Johnny Rubush. Johnny Rubush. Thank you. Next up, we got... Nate Morehouse coming out here, and we got another exciting, excited to see what the two minutes works out here. So he knows what to do, and looking forward to our conversation after this too. All right, we're gonna flip this. You ready? Oh yeah. Nate Morehouse. Two minutes and count. Yeah, I'm Nate Morehouse. I'm, I, I am an entomologist. Um, I study how insects and spiders sense the world. That's my passion in life, is understanding how these small animals and their enormous variety on the planet can see the world, can see color, can see motion, can see depth, can sense the electric fields around them, or the humidity, or hear us across the room. and. Um, you know, talk, you were talking earlier about how plants move, and one of the things that plants need help with moving around is their gametes, right? They need help with sex. And that's one of the things that the insects that I study help plants with. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to know that the flowers that we see so much beauty in the world are actually beautiful simply because that's what these insects want to see. Sometimes it's actually really quite uh, lascivious. So some orchids, for example, will smell and look and be shaped exactly like the female of a species. And it gets the insect male to show up and try to mate with the flower, right? But other flowers are just simply things that really turn an insect on or excite it in some way. And they get rewarded by um, not just sugar. We oftentimes think about uh, nectar being sugar, but it also has sometimes caffeine, sometimes nicotine, sometimes cocaine in it. And so there are all sorts of rewards that insects get out of this whole arrangement. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this, this relationship, which has gone back millions and millions of years, has not only shaped the insects and the spiders, but it's also shaped the plants. Right? So the beauty that you see on your farm, when your farm is in bloom, comes from the insects doing what, Andy? Wake the farm up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what? Look at that sand dial's out right there, too. Oh, he, so he totally just like handed it right there to wake the farm up. That's like, that's amazing. That is wonderful. <laughs> So, so many colorful images of bugs and even itchy ones and all kinds of images of insects and how they're moving through the ecosystem just flooding through from all of that. And I even saw the bugs that were just like getting funky and dancing and like getting super sexy with each other. And like some of them were even getting super sexy with the flowers. That's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that they teach us is that we have this ten tendency to think that the world that we live in, the sensory world that we live in, is the entire world, right? It feels so immersive to us, right? We walk through it, we hear sounds, we see things, and it turns out that we're only experiencing a small slice of what the world is. And a bee or a butterfly or a jumping spider sees a totally different slice 
They can see things, they can sense things that we have no perception of. And that's just part of their world. That's how they navigate it. I'm, I'm like, like, I got like into the groove of how you were slicing life, you know, like, it's like as if it's this like loaf of bread life and it's like, you get this slice, then you get this slice, then you get this much toast, you know, and I, I like how they all mix together though and there's some sort of slice in there for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we share slices. We share slices. We can see yeah. a lot of the colors that insects can see, but a bunch of them are missing for us, right? So, like, first we were talking about the big slice, but now you're talking about the small slice, you know, like, little, like, moments that are shared. It's, like, better slices of life that are shared, you know, like, little two-minute slice, and then you go a different way, and then there's, like, the slice of life. That's right, and the spice of life, right? Oh, absolutely. About the spice. <laughs> The spice, the spice must flow. Must always flow. The spice must flow. Most of our spices are there to try to avoid being eaten by insects, right? Plants are trying all the time yeah, to avoid different. being, and they're winning, right? It's a green world because the plants have won in kind that war. Yeah, absolutely. Like, who, who's going to come and eat this? Who's not going to come and eat this because there's certain chemicals on it? Things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But oftentimes, the insects overcome that. So something that's meant to keep them from eating the plant becomes the thing that they use to figure out that they're eating the right plant. Like so, like you're talking about, like some of these rewards in the plants. Yeah. Well, no. So, so um, let's think about brassica crops, right? Okay. Brassica crops have mustard oils in them. It's part of their flavor. This actually evolved to try to avoid being eaten by insects that try to eat brassica crops. But now a lot of insects are specifically eating brassicas because they because want they those black. mustard oils. They use those to protect themselves from other things. Right. Yeah. So things have changed. Yeah, the, the whole ecosystem can change just from the simple chemicals exuding in a plant and how the insects choose to choose which to, ones to eat, which ones not to eat. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have a question Whereas for you the, guys. Garlic, the garlic, they looped in and like what gets sprayed and what doesn't get sprayed, you know, like these human interactions, these other animals, like a buffalo herd, like what gets stomped, what doesn't. What's a, what's a brassica crop? A brassica crop is yeah. a example would be like broccoli, but there's ah. others in it, they're all from originally the same plant. One of, one of the funniest ones, I mean, it's not funny, but it's just okay, interesting yeah, words and culture. Rapeseed, you guys have heard of rapeseed, right? Yeah, absolutely. What a weird name for a plant. What kind of farmer wants to be like, I grow rapeseed. <laughs> oh my. You know, it's like, they, they... Oh my. But it's probably one of the most close to the natural form of the brassica, of that family. We grow it for so many other things, the... Stalk, we grow it as a kohlrabi, we grow it as a leaf, we grow it as a cabbage or a kale, we grow it as broccoli for the flower. Well, yeah, Brassica rape was, was uh, domesticated around the Mediterranean Rim. It was one of the first exchanged uh, technologies, agricultural technologies. We actually know that because the word rapa shows up in Eastern cultures, East Asian cultures, right. and that helps us to, to track how it was traded along the Silk Road 5,000 years ago. Yeah. And the butterflies that I study followed it out that way, actually. Wow. Okay. The and cabbage they, white, they the humble you, cabbage white. Is it amazing how a cabbage. butterfly, like just studying it and having a relationship with it, that it can tell you all these different things? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you see a white butterfly in town here just about any time of year, it's probably the cabbage white. The cabbage white. Yeah, wow. Pyaris rapi. That's the butterfly right? named after. Guys. Yeah, no, I can tell you all really sorts of fascinating things about that little backyard animal. Are, are they the same ones that are very attracted to a lavender flower? I know in this area, yeah, there's yeah. always that same white butterfly. Would absolutely. You, would you call it a butterfly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's Pyrus rapi. Yeah. Pyrus rapi. Yeah, it came here from Europe. It was introduced right around the time of the Civil War here. It came in like a and it rode rail lines into the interior of the country. Oh, I'm not even oh we gotta it. make a movie. I'm not even wow. kidding. Train it's like line. Renegade Butterfly. Yeah, trains are made <laughs> of <adventures. laughs> the rail yards. So they're not even white to each other, though, because they can see into the ultraviolet. So they're actually like a deep violet purple to each other in the oh, white wow. areas Ooh. of the way. Yeah, and the 
the males are, are deeper purple than the females, and that's because the female butterflies prefer more colorful males. Wow, okay. That's how it is in real life. That's how it is in real life. Yeah, she should. Yeah, she should. Do you think they can see into the future? Like, is that partially why they see it in a different color? Do you think that, have you noticed, or is there a way to know if an insect can see into the future? Well, uh, I know that jumping spiders can make plans for the future. So they can see a goal, and then they can take a route that takes them out of sight of that goal, and they can plan that route out of sight of where they're headed yeah. and arrive at their destination. So that's the way of planning for the future. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I know, like, like, flies, for example, if I'm trying to swat a fly, like, sometimes they get in the house, of course, you know, a house fly, and I'll try to swat it. And before I even go to squat it, it's like it already knows what I'm about to do, so I don't even bother squatting it. Well, that's because it can see time in finer detail than you can. So we can see about 60 things that happen per second with our vision. Actually, in low light like this, it's only about 15. That's why movies are called flicks, because they used to be flickering at 15 frames per second. Okay. Right? Like those like those like house flies can see 200 things happen in, in any single second. Wow, they can watch like so they're all way the channels. Ahead of you. Like, they're way ahead of you. Wow, they can watch 200 channels at one time and take <laughs> in so much information. They can be processing 200 different things at a time. And they probably have a language that's much faster than our own. So they can communicate and think about it and process it a lot faster. Like, never think about how when you think with words, you process things a lot slower than when you just take it into like a picture form, even if it's an abstract thought. You could just like have this abstract thought just come through and move all this energy and you all of a sudden in a new place, recalibrated your head and you're thinking differently. And you can just like keep going and just keep going with it like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you know how when you arrive in a place for the first time, you build some kind of mental map of that place? and then you live there afterwards and your map totally changes. Yeah, your perspective yeah, yeah. of the place is totally different. Also, the hill is a lot bigger than you thought it was. That, that's right, that's right. <laughs> or, it's, or it's next to the library and you didn't remember that or whatever, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, well, a lot of animals will make these kinds of maps of their environments as well, especially bees, right? Okay. They're even communicating that with their waggle dance to tell others where on that map they should be going to, to get more nectar, That's right? That's funky farm stuff. That waggle dance. That's right. Is that an official term? I'm oh, yeah, it's totally question. an official term. Oh, for, oh, the oh, waggle well, dance of the honeybee. Yeah. <laughs> the waggle dance of the honeybee. Well, it comes from the honeybee shaking its ass, right? Yeah. Is that the part that it shakes? Is does, that actually does, what it's does a waggle. Does a waggle. Yeah. Yeah. And then they do other things like a little. Like, what, you want to see what that looks like? <laughs> yeah. They do it right here, and then they can see well, the live stream too. Well, they usually they usually are those things about you. Uh, they got full dancing action. They usually so, waggle sorry, up listen, in a line and then come around the side and then waggle up in a line. And the direction of the waggle is the direction of where the flowers are, and the length of the line tells you how far to go. Wow. Okay. So you got to pay attention to the shimmy. They, they can do it. They can do it. <laughs> they, they, they can really set, set up a sting, then, huh? like a real sting operation. Uh, that's right, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> that's <good. laughs> Honey, come on now. Yeah. So yeah, tell us some other interesting studies, or like what's one of the most interesting insect studies that you got really into and felt a passion for? I know you're a passionate guy with this stuff. Yeah, so. man, I, you, I could tell you all sorts of stuff. A couple of things that I've been excited about recently, <laughs> one of them is that we've discovered that a lot of pollinating insects can sense the electrical charge of flowers because when a bee lands on a flower, it discharges the static electricity. It changes the electrical state of that flower. And bees that come by later can tell that it's been recently visited simply by its electrical charge. So they sense that, yeah, exactly, wow. exactly. And uh, just a couple of days ago, something came out about how hawk moths, which are, are big nighttime pollinators. Hawk moth. Hawk moth, yeah, okay. absolutely. The spingidae, they're the fastest flying insects in the world. They're amazing. Uh, they're what a tomato hornworm is. Okay. As a caterpillar, it turns into a hawk moth. And they mostly pollinate plants at night. 
Um, we know that they can see color under starlight conditions, so they have these incredible eyes that let them see things that we'd never be able to see at night. Um, but we just found out that they can, they can sense the humidity of a flower. They actually have humidity sensors that let them tell whether or not there's actually nectar in the flower or not. If it's dry, they don't stop. That's, that's major by design. That's right. That's right. That's, that's major by design. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so before you were talking about the uh, white cloud butterfly, or white, the yeah, white the type cabbage, of, cabbage white, yeah. The cabbage white, and you said that it, it saw an ultraviolet. Yeah, yeah. So, and then you study these things, right? So then, so the microchips and all the chips that are printed in our computers and everything, there's a proprietary light that's used UAV light. Mm -hmm. So did they learn about that from people like you? How to make that machine? No, not from me directly. I probably would okay. be <laughs> probably be richer <laughs> if they had. <laughs> no, I mean we've known that ultraviolet light's out there. You know, I just think we're finding new uses for it. It doesn't. We can't see it with our eyes. It's actually the lenses of our eyes that absorb it because it's it's bad. For, for biological tissues. It's what gives us the sunburn, right? You put on sunscreen, it's gonna block the UV light to protect, to protect your cells. And some of the most sensitive cells you wanna protect are the ones in your retina, right? So long-lived animals like humans typically absorb the ultraviolet part of the light spectrum out before it arrives at the retina to protect their retinal cells. But you know, a butterfly is gonna live three weeks, so what does it care? And there's lots of information in the ultraviolet. Right? It's going to savor those TVs, I'm sure. Absolutely. Flying. Live fast, die young, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got three weeks. You got a question for me? Yeah. Hit me. You need a mic. Oh, you're amazing. Sorry about that. Um, and you make, like, I have a different respect for insects, like, for some reason. Um, Good. Good. I don't know. It's called entomology, okay. it's the study of insects. And I guess I'm also an arachnologist, which is the study of spiders. Okay, and so I guess my question is, what would make a person want to be, in a, like saying the way, saying all the things that you're saying, the way you're saying it, is so interesting. But what would lead you to this type of journey? Like, that's how did you want to grow up to study insects? That's a good question. Um, well, Andy knows this, I'm easily fascinated. I probably if you if you if you I, I love when they come up out of the symphony section and ask the questions as part of the show. We love it. We totally welcome it. And so like, I would love to go into that and hear about it. I love your stories, and I know you've been passionate about this for a long time. So yeah, you share what you want to share about how you got interested in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I grew up I grew up in an inner city neighborhood in Rochester, New York. And uh, there were more kinds of insects and spiders and centipedes in that little tiny city lot than anything else, right? And so uh, as a little kid, four, four years old, five years old, I'm out there grubbing around, watching stuff showing up to flowers. My mom had a garden that brought a lot of, a lot of uh, insects in. Then a neighbor down the street made the mistake of giving me my first insect net when I was seven years old. And it was a mistake because the she had the best gardens in the neighborhood. And you know, some, sometimes you swing for a butterfly in and you catch a flower. And I caught a lot of her flowers and I think she wished she could take that insect and take that. So I've always been fascinated with them. I mean, there's just endless varieties of them. 30 million kinds of insects in the world probably. If you're, if you're fascinated by variety, if you get excited about different kinds of coffee or tea or plants, etc. There's nothing rivals insects for that kind of variety. So I've, I've always been interested in it. But I've thought about doing a whole lot of other different kinds of things as well. Uh, just keep coming back to it. Anywhere in the world I am, no matter what I'm doing, somehow I'm a biologist at heart. It just kind of reminds me of like the tiny big world. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like you say, so. Well, and it really is magic in the backyard. You know, I think. One of the things that nature programming's done is to make people think that you got to go to the, to the, you know, to South Africa to see interesting stuff in nature. But I could tell you stories to rival the lions from your backyard. It's all happening in there, you know. That's cool. Yeah, you just got to take the time to look. 
and the small world is the place to look. Now, no, like, like, like this is the Wake the Farm Up show, so everybody knows, even though they don't know it yet, I'm going to ask you about eating bugs. Oh, sure, yeah. What's yeah. your favorite bug to eat, and like, <laughs> what are some other bugs that you've eaten that's always fascinated me? I've eaten some oh, bugs man. before. No, I My mean, personal now, now favorite is... Like, Freezed, freeze dried crickets and stuff with like nacho cheese flavor on them and things like that. Oh yeah, did you eat that? Yeah, I mean I've eat, I've eaten them. You or you know. Well, my my personal favorite so far has been ants in a pine forest that were coming out of an old pine log. They actually kind of tasted like pine nuts. Yeah, yeah, you know ants are good to eat. Uh, I know that that probably bothers a lot of people to think about, but one of my favorites is um, weaver ants. In Australia, oh, they got these bright, bright emerald green abdomens to them, and they're not nice. If you get them down the back of your shirt, you're gonna be sorry for it because they're gonna swarm you up. They they weave nests up in eucalyptus trees, right? Okay. So their their nests are not in the ground; they're up, and they weave them like a bird nest up in the trees. But if you catch them, you can eat you can eat their abdomen. The rear part, right? That's that bright jewel I, green, I and it's got this like almost like a like a. Um, they're big. They are big. Yeah, they're probably an inch long, and and uh, and they taste like um, salt and vinegar chips. Just instantly, right off yeah. the right off the bush. Right off the bush. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I want to try those. Yeah. Weavers. Weaver ants. <laughs> yep. Some ants are pretty nutty top and flavored as well, though. <laughs> They are. Speaking of nuts. Hey, question too. Another, so do you know the percent of people around the world, though, that do eat bugs on a daily basis and, like, at their markets and stuff? I mean, it's pretty, actually pretty high, right? Two billion, it's big, yeah. Two billion. Two is million it, is people. It two? two billion. Two billion. Right. Outside of the West, like, in the yeah. East, it's totally normal. It's, it's healthy, crazy. sustainable yeah. protein. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah, yeah. What, do you, I, what do you think? Would, it sounds like we've got some people that are interested in that market in a general sense. So I'm curious, like, what do you think it would take to break, like, to, so say we pulled up in a food truck, right? Yeah. <laughs> How are we serving that? Are people going to be like, oh man, yeah, oh man, I want that cricket sandwich, man. <laughs> you know, I hate to be cynical about it, but it probably is going to take it looking like beef. You know, really? I mean, like people think? are willing to eat all sorts of stuff that they don't know where it comes from. And like beyond me, who knows what Wait, beyond me is made out of? Well, I do not want that. Break the form. share with you that, yeah, that I think people might enjoy, right? So, so if you ever have a little black ant on your counter, you know, they come in the summer. I'm always fighting these little black ants in my house all summer long. I never quite win. They're always there the next year. They're called odorous house ants, right? And I challenge you, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I, I hate to recommend taking a living thing's life, but there's so many of them. I don't think they're going to miss one of their buddies. If you, if you pinch it between your fingers and roll, it's gonna smell like blue cheese. Like exactly like blue cheese. Turns out, it's actually the same smell that, that you get from rotting coconut, of all things. And it's the same chemical as what, the, as, as what it occurs in blue cheese to give it that funky smell, and what the same bacteria that grow on, uh, on rotting coconuts produce. It's in the little abdomens of the set. So just pick it up and you're going to smell a, a, a Roquefort or, a, you know, like a Maytag blue cheese smell right away. That's awesome. Yeah. Only do it once, though, man. You know, Why only once? Would you like I just, I hate, I mean, these, these animals are magic. These animals are magic. So I hate taking animal life when I eat them. You know when they're, like, in your house, like, you don't like yeah. getting yeah. ants to move out? Yeah. Like, and food 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 food. You like feed them and stuff. Like I know people do that. They, like, eat, no, I don't, that I don't want. Smells. I don't want more roommates. I don't want more roommates. Yeah. I know there's things like peppermint plants don't like. Yeah. So just having a few peppermint plants and certain vectors along the outside. Of the things like peppermint ants. No, there's things like peppermint, peppermint ants. 
Are they good? <laughs> Are peppermint ants good? Should we get some? Where would you order if you wanted to order some peppermint ants or ants in general? Peanut butter ants or blue cheese ants? There you go. Well, those are going to come to you in a couple of months, so no need to order them from any place. <laughs> Amazon Prime delivery to the kitchen counter. Blue cheese barbecue. Well, the world of meaning for an ant is all chemicals. I mean, they can see, right? And they've got tactile sensation, but the world is full of chemical messages for ants. They communicate with it. They tell each other when there's danger. They tell each other where food is. How do you think they experience it? It's a good question. I mean, you know, I, I tend to think that, that animals live in what we might call a flow state, right? They're just, things are happening. They're making meaning out of it, and they're, they're choosing where to go next, right? You get into that flow state on a good bike ride or good run or dancing all night, you hit that flow space. I think that's a lot more akin to what animals are doing all the time. I like that. It's, you know, I like getting into my flow space and getting in my animal on and like just flowing and knowing I'm, I'm doing things and I know I'm doing the right things and I'm moving in the right direction. And if I get you know, go and step in a sticky trap or something, I guess that's what happens, you know? I just keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Less worry for the future, more time for the present. Yeah. Yeah. yeah th thanks again for coming up. I'd love to have you back on the show. I definitely Anytime, would man. love to talk more bugs on this show and insects and, you know, like there's, you know, it'd be a great time to have you up here. I know it, like we got so much time for the show tonight, so like we got to yeah. keep this show going here, but Everybody's getting excited. They're all kind of like, they're about to throw tomatoes at me. They're like, no, we want them up there for another hour. Yeah. No, all good, man.
that one's fun. But other than that, I'm just a musician, and, and I came here to educate myself. And so far, I've done that, and especially with the ants and and the pollinization of flowers. And I understood the thing about the bees. I was in the Boy Scouts, Troop 101, Glendale, Ohio. And, uh, you learned uh, what poison ivy and a bunch of different little herbs and stuff. And different trees, oak tree, and just different things. Just to earn little merit badges and stuff. I participated with and all that. Merit badges awarded here. But I, 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 I applied that in the hood. I grew my, and it's growing and surviving off vegetables in the hood is a definite thing that can be done. You can, you don't have to go to Kroger to buy tomatoes, grains. You don't have to go buy no corn. You can grow corn in Cincinnati, Ohio. You know, watermelons in Cincinnati, Ohio. You know. Yeah, yeah. Wake the farm up. Yeah. Woo! But uh, I enjoy it every summer, but I'm thinking about this uh growing through the winter, because I got a big backyard, you know, and I I neglected my greenhouse that I had in the backyard for, I neglected it for six years. So all the plastic, it's just a frame. Mm, so. But it's, it's something I can do as a project, you know, sometime. What, what kind of things did you grow in it when you did grow in your greenhouse? I'm a realist. Oh, uh, cannabis. <laughs> I grew my tomatoes outside the greenhouse. Yeah, I think, I think he course. said he had a, a canning can business. Can it be? Is that a canning business? Can 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 he said, okay. He had the tomatoes right outside. <laughs> Now, now I, 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 we know I heard you tell a story a couple times, but what happens when some of these plants do you play for them? Sometimes we talk about this the most before. Yeah. How, how do you feel play about like the playing plants. the guitar? What do you play, What songs do you play for? Them? Maybe we can hear play for them. I still can hear what you say. You, you play music for the plants. Like, is there things like you yeah, sing I want to say something about, about that. that. I got plants. I got house plants, of course. I got house plants in my house. You know, as soon as you go up the steps on the foyer, there's house plants and, and weed plants. Weeds. Plants. And, and, and believe it or not, I play a lot of heavy metal. I play a lot of Ozzy Osbourne. Okay. I play, of, I play a lot of Sabbath and Parliament Funkadelic. You know, and my plants don't have no problem with it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it gets, helps them give them some structure, yeah. form, it's a vibe, it's an energy, yeah. And, and, and I play guitar in the house every day, so the plants are used to me playing the guitar. I got, I think, I think six cats and one dog. The dog is older than the cats. He's like an alarm. You, if you walk down the street past my house, he's barking. You know, he's inside the house. Yeah. He likes a good sound. But, but the animals don't like don't don't uh, disagree with music or plants in the house. It all makes an ecosystem. Yeah. 
The dog and the cats get along together. I've never once seen them fight or disagree. Not even during a metal song? No. Like not even play fight or something? Start a little mosh pit, like a bunch of cats mosh pit. I remember, uh, but well, life is good. Life is good. I want to say this to everybody yeah. in here. Yeah. Life is good. And the reason that life is good because somewhere in the universe, it is very important that we understand this, get a whole understand it or whatever. How anybody in here looks at it. Somewhere in the universe, some super being or some energy or something made every one of you guys different yeah. from the rest of the, the uh, I don't want to put no system down, no government down, I don't want to put nobody down, but people are different and people have different thoughts, people have different concepts of life and how they want to live their life and what they want to do. And if a person say they want to live off the grid, uh, I didn't, oh, sorry about that. I don't think <laughs> But if people want to live off the grid, it, it, it's a lot that we can do to not destroy what was left for us. Yeah. 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 You know, that's a lot that we can do. And I'm going to sum it up, I'm going to sum it up with the, with the proof in the pudding. And, and, and with rapper people or something say don't talk about it or be about it. But I'm 64 years old and I've been a doctor block participant with my name on the street sign for over 25 years. That means I get up, take my medication, I roll my medication up, I smoke it on a Sunday morning, and I get out before the church people get out, because the church probably me, and I live on a, a, a street that, that's close to a lot of fast food restaurants, so by the time they get up to the light where I'm at, and they, they done eat their food, they throw it out the door, cars. And so, for many years I've been doing it, wherever I go, I do that, you know. Right. And that's one thing I learned as a little boy, watching black and white TV before it was colored television, just transition into that mode. There used to be a cartoon commercial come on, Don't Be a Litter Bug, and I took yeah. that to heart. You know, I find myself still when I get home in the evening, I got cigarette butts in my pocket. Yeah. Because wherever I'm at, I don't throw them on the ground. Yeah. You know, I kind of like <laughs> with my finger, and then I take the butt and put it in my pocket. Yeah, you, you, know. you want to like be a funky bug, not a litter bug, you know, our <laughs> entomology <laughs> <laughs> we prefer that. We and it's a, and bugs, it's a big difference. Right. And if you even look it up, or ask any great scholar in the funk world of uh, what is funk, funk is literally making something out of nothing. Mm. Yeah. 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 All of you guys in here are funk. Right. Now, I remember bringing you some funky fruit, those ground cherries. Yes. Remember yes, that? We yes, were, like, we yes. were crunching those down. I enjoyed them, and I can't wait to plant my seeds. Yeah, his eyes lit up when, like, I held one up to him, and I was like, you can save one of these and plant, like, 20 of them next spring. And, and, and I he was still like, got it. yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I still got it. Those ground cherries are amazing. Once he starts growing them, too, they'll kind of come back like a weed. I love the plants that are like weed. They'll just keep vigorously showing up, trying to feed you and support you. 
There's just little things you gotta do, acknowledge that they're there and let them go to seed again the next year. And recognize that one of their little sprouts and they're just coming up and starting, you know, when you can recognize that, then you can start seeing them sprouting up everywhere. But you just need at least one to come sprout up every year somewhere, and then you got seed stock again. You can give to your friends and your neighbor, your whole block could be adopting some ground cherries. Oh, so, that's an annual? Yeah. Yeah. I get to talk to you, dude. This is an annual, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got that. Yeah. All day practice. So, I'm so cool now. Yeah, we are so cool, man. Like, I would love, like, did you, would you care to share some mu- some of your music? I know we got some of the stuff set up here. Would you care to share some of that with the podcast here tonight, right now? Yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah, we want to hear it. Right here, people started going crazy, jumping up. People were trying to climb on the stage, everything. They knew we was about to play some music. So here's some of the cuts from P-Funk mixing with Stefan 101 and Andy the Elf. We got C-Mac playing some bass with him there too. Are y'all ready? Yeah, so we're all getting ready now. P-Funk's about to play us some music. And the whole show kind of goes into musical and poetic realms. So enjoy some of these cuts. Hope you enjoyed these conversations. It's been fun. It's gonna be yeah, I forgot fun. to mention that tea, the pineapple sage, is actually a very good diuretic too. You know, it'll help make you have to go pee. So you gotta make sure you stay hydrated, get a lot of it. Some of it's gonna move out through you. Um, we had some people that were dehydrated back there, so we took care of that, and made sure they're hydrated and feeling good again. There's a uh, <laughs> Looks like the snack stands are clear now. We got people are out in the aisles. I see here they're getting ready for some dancing. It looks like they're already starting to move out to this uh, step in front of here.
table oh. with the Aronia berries. The Aronia berries, they come in here. It's, you know, times change. We talk about how the insects get different creations in different directions from the different chemicals coming out of the plants. Well, we also get that with us and our connection. So the more that we can reconnect in our passion and life into the nature realm, the more it all makes sense, this whole puzzle of life. There's things like these aronia berries. They're this berry that's been sitting here the whole time, native, growing in the bush. And when you eat them, they help relieve a little bit of radiation that we've been exposed to in this world. Right now, there's chemical properties in them, antioxidants in them that help your body rebuild it and protect yourself from them. It's a food of the future. We're getting exposed to more of this stuff. There's more of this thing, like you get little, like, where, like everybody has the same earring on, these little white stick earrings that like stick out of their ears. And like there's radiation that's happening in between your head. You can do that, it's fun. You can eat these berries and it'll help you do it longer. That's what I hope, you know. It'll help keep that radiation out from side brain. And some people, you know, we're like set up right next to a 5G tower, you know. We're like waking up in the morning and we're like looking out our window. And there's the tower right in our window. We're looking down on the city below. Eat some aronia berries. It'll help you feel better after all that exposure to that 5G. And you can live where you're at and you enjoy it. Why not? It's a food of the future. I mean, there's foods of the past, you know, for insects. There's foods of the future for insects. Same with people. Different things that come in. That's just some aronia, aronia funk in there. Aronia on every vlog. They don't taste that great right off the bush, but when you take it off and you dry it out, and you know, it starts to be like it's magical, like cush. And you can just be like crunching those like little Captain Crunch berries. You sprinkle them in your oatmeal, you sprinkle them in your salad, however you like it. You know, when you eat them when they're dry, they taste so much better. It's a lot like a lot of the other superfood berries, like goji berries, acai berries. There's common ones that you can get at the gas station in little juice bottles for like $12.99. What? But well, you know what? Hey, we got these things growing right here. We can do it better. And it's like, why not? Uh, we can do both. We can do all three. With the farmer. I just want to make sure that you can do it for your own family. You know? Like, you got to have your superfood berries. I want to make sure you got your superfood berries. Hey. Get your superfood berries.
That, that one was like burned down in here, right there. These people right here. Let's all shout out for these people that are like in New Zealand and shit.
what's their relation with the pawpaw tree? Like, what's the reward the tree gives to them? Nothing at all. Well, the reward the tree gives to them is nutrition, but it's not a reward for the tree. What, just they eat the fruit? They, no, they, they eat the leaves, man. Okay, that's Cat interesting, because there is a lot of anti-insect and insecticidal properties inside pawpaw leaves and bark. That It's interesting that there's a few that have adapted to eating that. Maybe that's why they look so metal. They're like, yeah, that's, what's your poison? I eat pawpaw leaves. That's right.
Thank you for joining us for this episode. It's been funky, fun. Never know what we're going to do. We're always going to take a formula and mix it up and put something new into it. So come back. Enjoy the show. We'll keep getting the sound better. We're working on that. Hopefully in 2023, you'll be able to hear every single word we say throughout the whole entire episode. Hopefully in 2023, we're going to have some amazing shows come to your town. Let us know. Keep in touch. Here we grow. That was a great show. Time for some bonus tracks. Oh. Uh-huh. 